Hello, hello, hello. So welcome to another live stream. It is October 1st, Thursday at 6 p.m. And uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about persuasion as it relates to marketing. And so my name is Rich Shefferin and welcome to another live stream. I do them every Tuesday at 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern and every Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern. If uh, you're watching me, uh, please say hi. Let me know where you're watching me from. Uh, good to really reconnect with everyone. And so would love to know uh, who's here with me. And as always, I try to make these as much of a dialogue uh, as opposed to a monologue. And so with that said, uh, your participation in every which way is greatly uh Greatly appreciated. And so whether you comment, emote, share, what have you, uh, I appreciate it. So let's see here. Who's joining us today? And I see the comments coming in. So let's take a look. Hey, Rich, can you help me find the right answer to my question, please? What is the difference between a sales funnel and a marketing funnel? Well, um, Jarek, thanks for the question. Um, it really depends on who you're asking, I think, because you, there is, there's not even a clear agreement on a definition of marketing or a definition of sales. So therefore, uh, a clear definition of a marketing funnel versus a sales funnel would also uh, not necessarily be definitive. However, if you're asking me my definitions, um, while I wouldn't necessarily distinguish between a sales funnel and a marketing funnel, if I were, um, I really see marketing as setting up the beliefs that when someone takes action, they will default to. And so I see sales as really pushing someone to take action and marketing really establishing what direction that action will take, if that makes sense. Uh, that's kind of built upon a bunch of other beliefs that I have, but, uh, marketing in my mind is, uh, to set up all the right kind of, um, elements or characteristics, or in my opinion, beliefs that when someone is going to decide to do that thing or to get that result or chase that outcome, they will default to the beliefs that are in place that marketing established. But so I look at sales as kind of pushing someone out of status quo. And when they get pushed out of status quo, they go where their beliefs kind of are in line with. I, it's that's my perspective about it. I, I don't know if that helps, Jarek. If it does, then if you get that, then a, mar a marketing funnel would be more about setting up the beliefs. A sales funnel would be more about making the sale and then upsells and downsells it, from my, from where I sit. Um, but I could see other people having numerous different definitions, and I wouldn't necessarily say that they were wrong. Uh, Ulrich, hey, my man. Cool. Cool to see you. Tuning in from Boston. Yeah, it's been a while, my friend. And Jason, a loyal uh, watcher. Uh, thanks, Jason, for being here from Tampa. Uh, you are here quite frequently, and same with Hugo. Uh, glad you are really excited, Hugo. I think we're going to spend a bunch of time on persuasion. I think um, today we'll just start out, and I'm going to share some some different concepts, but then I think we'll go deeper into a bunch of the areas that uh, persuasion integrates well with marketing. So I think we got lots to kind of go over there. So glad you're excited, Hugo. Uh, Melvin from upstate New York. Hey, Melvin. Um, I just got done texting with my daughter who's in Syracuse, New York. So she's up there too. Eliz. Hey, Ri hey Rich. Hello again from Australia. Well, hello there. Is it Elise? Is that how I pronounce it? Or is it Eliz? Uh, I would imagine it's Elise. But let me know. Jarek, you're in Ireland. Very cool, my friend. Ned from Washington, D.C. or near Washington, D.C. Brandon. All right. Hey, Rich. Glad to be here. Uh, we're in the last quarter of the year when all the magic happens. So good time to skill up on persuasion. Very cool to see you, Brandon. Uh, uh, and thanks for the comment. Uh, 
Omar Martinez Separo from New Jersey. Hi, Omar. And Leon, uh, I see you interviewed Russell Brunson on his book funnel. When are we going to see a Rich Sheffern book? We want it. Yeah, I've written a few. I just never released any. Um, I keep going back and forth in my head, Leon, like what, what kind of book I want to write. Do I want, uh, am I trying for a bestseller? Am I trying for like something like breakthrough advertising that is not a bestseller, complicated, but stands the test of time? Uh, kind of probably overthinking it as I generally do. <laughs> oh God, have I been picking out the last couple of days? And I think I can see it on my face. Uh, that's the only downside of uh, doing all these live streams. It becomes very clear to me uh, uh, <laughs> how I look since I'm looking at a visual of me the whole time we're talking here. Uh, hey, Joe in West Palm Beach. Good to see you, my friend. Hey, Mr. Vogelman. Uh, I was persuaded to come here today despite the 95 degree heat and no air conditioning. Oh, my God. Why no air conditioning, my friend? Uh, yeah, Satuk. Yeah. Yasutaka uh, from Japan. Good morning, Yasutaka. Syracuse is like two and a half hours away from me. Wow. Okay, well, that's far. Uh, certainly uh, closer than me, though. It would be more than a day drive, I think. And Lisa from Miami Beach. Good to see you, Lisa. And Albert, uh, just listen to one of your interviews. You're a unique human being. Uh, I hope that's a positive. Um, write all of them. Yeah. I would like to. Compressor broke. That sucks. Okay. So I thought that um, before we even get into marketing and persuasion, right, I thought it'd be good to talk about persuasion a little bit from a standpoint of kind of the ethics of it and not to belabor the point. But I think that, um, well, let me say this first, I guess. Um, well, let me, I'm going to backtrack for a second. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have read or gotten or seen or even heard of uh, the one sentence persuasion course. Uh, if you haven't, it's a free PDF from Blair Warren and it is rather good. And if you haven't read it, you should. It's about 20 pages or 16 pages or something like that. And it's called the one sentence persuasion course. And uh, Blair also created another course called, uh, well, that's just a PDF. He did create a course on persuasion called the Hidden Keys. Uh, what was it called? I forget. Hold on. The Forbidden Keys to Persuasion. And um, I think it. I think it's a great course. Um, I think there are lots of great courses out there. I'm, I'm close friends and a big fan of Kenrick Cleveland, uh, who's probably one of the foremost experts on persuasion out there. Um, but I wanted to pull from this Blair Warren uh, course on what he says about manipulation, because I think that it is, um, I think it is spot on. And I don't think I could say it better myself. And so instead of trying to, I think I'll just pull up the notes and let you see what he said, and because uh, I can't say it better. So let's take a look here. I got to see how I do this here. Um, okay, let's see. What are we doing? We're going to go to my desktop. Oh, my God. That's almost even spot on. Very cool. All right, let's see. Cool. Let me know if you guys can see that. And while you, I'm looking here at the uh, at the comments here for a second. Um, oh, you guys can't see me. That's a bummer. Um, why can't you see me? That's a little bit weird. Anyway, yeah, why can't you see me? So what you're looking at here are my notes. Uh, my notes from uh, the course. Let's see. I'm just looking to see. Show picture in picture. Oh. Let's see. There we go. All right. 
Um, and now let me just move myself over here. All right. So, uh, oh, I forgot I can't move that. All right. So, uh, forbidden keys to persuasion, Blair Warren, ugly truth number one, we are all manipulators. And, f and since few of us can accept this, <laughs> whoops, most of us are not only hypocrites, but also less effective in our communication with others as we could be. Yeah, you guys can see it. Cool. All right. So let's just take a look at this. And then we'll look at a few other parts. Uh, the degree to which we will be able to influence others will be in direct proportion to the amount of truth we can accept about human nature. Hope. First, the fundamental source of their power comes a brutally honest understanding of human nature. And second, if we can stomach some ugly truths about ourselves, the same understandings can be used to improve lives and relationships, not just destroy them. This is a quote from Saul Alinsky. Life is a corrupting process from the time a child learns to play his mother against his father in the politics of when to go to bed. He who fears corruption fears life. Saul Alinsky. People are already manipulative. What I am doing is encouraging them to stop lying to themselves about it, to understand why it's often necessary, and to learn how to do it more effectively. We are hypocrites. The truth is, everyone is a manipulator. We manipulate the environment, we manipulate people, and we manipulate circumstances all in an effort to meet our needs and ensure our survival. Denying this doesn't make one less of a manipulator. Denying this makes one a less conscious manipulator, and that can make one a less effective manipulator. Why is it important to admit this? Because the more we try to pretend we aren't manipulative, the more we tend to lose sight of the true psychological dynamics of our relationships. We begin to relate to one another in a world of make-believe, where powerful persuasion can only occur by chance. All right. Let's see. What was the other? Uh, yeah, let's see. Ugly truth number two. Our biggest impediment to understanding and influencing human behavior is that our sense of morality unconsciously filters our perception of others, and as a result, invisibly alters the way we interact with them. Ulterior motives aren't just the tools of others, but of ourselves. Or, as Aristotle said, all that we do is done with an eye to something else. Whether it's propaganda, mind control, mental programming, or any of the forbidden areas, it is usually a masking of intent that makes them viable tools for change. And then it goes into why we can't be straight with one another. So, that is is I think the best way to kind of talk about manipulation because marketing in and of itself is manipulation, right? Leadership is manipulation. Uh, one of the best definitions that I ever read on leadership was, so I'm going to mute myself for a second here. I apologize. I just got a cough. Um, yeah, one of the best definitions, by the way, how do I sound today? Uh, actually, I think I have my headphones working today, so let's see. Is this, no, I don't have them working. Okay, um, is from this book, The Last Word on Power. I think the author's name was Tracy Goss. She, if, whoever the author was, if it was Tracy Goss, she was the right-hand person or for Warner Earhart, someone who I have the utmost respect for. And... Um, the book's The Last Word on Power, and she said a leader is someone who was going to make a future, makes a future happen that wasn't going to happen anyway. A leader is someone who makes a future happen that wasn't going to happen anyway, right? The idea is, is that they make a future happen that is different than what would have naturally occurred. Hence, leadership, right? Moving people in a direction that they weren't already heading in. It doesn't take any leadership to get people to where they're or already en route to, right? And so there's manipulation there. And anytime that we get someone to t take an action that they wouldn't have taken without our communication, is a form of manipulation. Now, it could be positive, it could be negative, but nonetheless, it is manipulation. 
So uh, let's check in back with the comments, and then we will press on. All right. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay. So Brandon read The Hidden Laws. You read it. Did he make it into a book? That's interesting. Uh, I guess maybe he did. It was a course. Like, I remember listening to the audios and stuff. Pretty sure. Uh, hello, Priyat. Or Priyat. Um... Why don't you just put this here so I can actually look at the screen? Um, all right. Yeah, that's better. Okay. Thank you, Troy. You are my hero, as is anyone who shares the live stream. I appreciate you greatly. Uh, it, it gives me a stronger reason to do these. So I appreciate that very much, Troy. So thank you. Um, true. All right. We are all manipulators, particularly as chiropractors. Very funny there, Chris. Um, was just going over Tao Te Ching that masters that. Oh, very cool. That Saul was a communist. Yep. Well, community activist, communist, um, Rules for Radicals is what he wrote. Also a good book on manipulation and persuasion. Uh not necessarily a fan of his politics, but that does not mean that the man was not bright and that he wrote some really good stuff. Andrew, you're not late. You're here, and that's all that's important, and thank you for being here, and thank you for commenting. We even manipulate ourselves. Yes, we do. We are motivated by desires. True that. Sounding very good. Cool. Last word on power, Tracy Goss. Yep, that's the book. Hi there. Uh, okay. Wow. That's Hebrew, isn't it? Uh, what does that say? Hare Hashem? I, I don't know. Something. Anyway. Um, so, okay. I used to be able to read Hebrew. Um, can't do it anymore. That's what happens when you don't look at something for years and years. Oh, my mom would be crying. Um, all right. So. Let's kind of take a look at a few things. So what I thought we would do, um, and, you know, for persuasion, like I said, we could talk about this for a ridiculous amount of time. There is so much that I could share with you on this. And so uh, what I thought we would do to start uh, is to pull up a document that I had my assistant create for me. A long time ago, um, I was, uh, I used to go to the beach every morning. I'd love to get back into that routine. I really should. Uh, I used to get up at like 4.30 in the morning or 5 o'clock in the morning, sometime around there, I don't remember. And I would work out for an hour, then hop in my car and drive to the beach and uh, write in my journal as the sun rose. And uh, then go swimming, then uh, write a blog post, then uh, head to the office. And one time when I was writing my journal, I uh, was writing on persuasion. And so I was writing up just different methods of persuasion. Uh, and I had my assistant Janine, because this was a long time ago, um, type them up for me. So I'm, I thought we could pull that up. Um, and go over a few of the elements there. And then uh, there, there's one that I want to go in deep on that I imagine you have never heard of before. If you did, it was taken from me. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, many of the things I guess out there have been. Um, so let's, uh, let's dive into this, okay? So let's, I'm going to go back here to my computer for a second. There we go. I should have, uh, I should have, um, what do you call it? What should I have done? I should have, why can't I get this to go? Why is it going, getting bigger? <laughs> As I make it, maybe I'm going to just go like this. All right. Uh, let's go like that. There we go. All right. But why is that? It's getting bigger as I make it, like, as I'm trying to uh, get this to get a little smaller. There we go. All 
All right. Let's see. All right. Can I make it a little bit smaller? There we go. All right, cool. So first one here, we're going to jump through. Well, maybe we'll go into this one too. Yeah. All right. So uh, the first one here is attention capture. Now, there's a big difference between attention capture and paying attention, right? I don't know that many people kind of make that distinction. I know Blair Warren does. So for those of you who read Blair Warren's Forbidden Keys, um, then this should be just a reminder that when you're paying attention to something, that's more of a conscious choice, right? When you get attention capture, that is more like hooking someone in and it's the equivalent of like when you're watching when you get lost in a movie or a book or anything like that your sense of self uh diminishes right that it kind of drifts away and and you are in a much more heightened state of suggestibility in that state in attention capture in fact when people hold on to attention through attention capture for a long enough period of time, uh, that in and of itself can cause great changes in beliefs and mindsets and things of that nature, right? So what's really happening is, as I have in my notes here, is that the conscious mind is fully occupied. And when the conscious mind is fully occupied, What's occupied is also the critical factor, the part of the brain that is determining what's true and what's not true. And so attention capture, right? That's one of the reasons why um, using a using any of the kind of uh, tactics out there um, like uh, I'm drawing a I'm drawing a blank on the word right now, and I apologize. Um, Jeez, I should know what this is. Um, pattern interrupt, blah, pattern interrupt, right? Pattern interrupts capture attention. And uh, then the question is, is what's done after that to hold it? But attention capture, right? And I think a lot of people don't make that distinction between getting people to pay attention versus capturing their attention. And they're totally different. Next, the core concept. I'm not going to belabor that point. Uh, we've gone over it and uh, numerous times. And, um, but for those who are not that familiar with it, I wrote a report on it. It's the, it, it's the marketing equivalent of a USP. It's the core theme of your entire marketing campaign drilled down to one sentence that if someone believes it, the default option then is to buy your product. And uh, I posted a 20 or so minute long presentation on it in the Facebook group. And so if you're not a member of the Facebook group, you definitely want to become one. Uh, there it is. Just strategic profits is what the Facebook group is called. And you should join. All right. So let's keep going now. All right. So the chain of beliefs, this is one of those things that... Uh, Kenrick and I actually developed together and the uh, it's the uh, well I'll read it first the underlying structure of beliefs and mindset shifts that you are trying to achieve in the mind of your prospects this can be in a global sense like the lifetime of a customer to a micro touch point like an individual message or a content chunk in a webinar so the idea here is is that if you know what actions you want your prospects to take, if you know what actions you want your customers to take, like ascending or referring or anything like that, then you can break that down into a series of beliefs from what they currently believe to where you want to take them so that the action then is a default response to the, to the beliefs that they hold. And so I, we started first, we came up with this concept of a chain of beliefs when uh, Kenrick was helping me work on a webinar and the idea there was let's kind of map out the different steps of taking someone where they start to I need to buy this right now. 
and what would those steps be? And then how do we cause those beliefs to kind of pop uh, like, you know, popcorn in their brain, right? Uh, at, at the different parts of the webinar so that that final belief uh, happens because every preceding belief happened. Don't know if that makes sense. If it doesn't, by all means, ask questions. Um, the uh, But I'll press on until I kind of revert back to the questions. And then if you had a question about any of these, I'll certainly be happy to answer them. Uh, what I wanted to get through was four and six. So we'll go through till six and then we're going to circle back because I want to talk about four and six specifically. So number four is preemptive problem creating or inventing the disease. And this is my unique method of surfacing the root cause of my prospect struggles, frustrations, challenges, and problems, and then using the new problem to redefine everything that the prospect is experiencing as a symptom of the new disease slash root cause. I imagine that that is not clear to many of you, um, unless you're kind of familiar with what I do already. So basically, it's about what preemptive problem creating is, is taking the problems of the marketplace and redefining those problems as symptoms of some deeper problem. The deeper problem being the cause of all of these problems that you've now redefined as symptoms. And because of that, you've done many things at the same time. Um, let me show you something. Yeah, let me show you something. Got to find it first. All right. Whoops. All right. For right now, I just really want to look at that part. Um, when you create a deeper problem of which now the problems in the marketplace are now symptoms of, right? Now, what? here's what you've done, right? You've absolved the prospect of the failure because there was no way for them to solve it if they were attacking the symptoms and not the problem, right? It proves that there isn't anything wrong with them, right? They've just been attacking the wrong problems. Because they've never tried to solve that deeper problem that has caused all these other problems, now that they know about it, it provides new found hope for the outcome they are pursuing. It provides a more appealing label than having these 10 problems just having this one problem that causes these as symptoms. And it separates the person from doing any of the things that they did before that they don't like about themselves. So many of you have, now let's go back to me for a second. So many of you have heard the story, right, of when I looked at the book Driven to Distraction and found that it, I felt like I was it was uh, I was reading something about me and I was it was talking about all the things that I had tried to solve about my behavior about who I was over the years and unsuccessfully successfully you know for brief moments of time and in that moment right when I was reading this book I had this feeling of newfound hope because now all of a sudden I didn't have all these other problems. I had one problem, ADD, and it was causing all of these issues, right? So I've shared before that that's the impact that I'm going for when I've written my free reports or created any of the marketing that I've created or helped others, right? That I'm trying to lead my prospects to an epiphany like that, right? And... I'm very much aware of what that is because I'm sharing that I, I came up with the concept and developed this process based on my own personal experience of how it happened to me. So, um, 
let's now go back to the comments for a little bit. Then we'll go back to the beach notes. And then at some point we'll pull back on that diagram. I'm sure some of you are interested in what the hell that diagram was. Um, so let's now take a look at where we were here. Wow, it's so cool to see so many people here. So thanks for being here all. Uh, Fruit of God is Priya. Oh, cool. Good to know. Uh, Jewish background. Yeah, Jewish background. I actually went to yeshiva, um, believe it or not. And all I remember, so that means I, for those who don't know, that means I studied the Old Testament in Hebrew four hours a day, every day, um, and then only had four hours left for English, math, science, social studies, and everything else uh, from nursery school all the way till sixth grade until I begged my parents to go to public school. Um, and all I remember, Melvin, is Sheket Pavakasha, which means please be quiet. Um, document time, yay. Oh, cool. Uh, um, that sounds like an awesome way to start the day. Yeah, it is an awesome way to start the day, especially the sunrise element of it. Need to get back to that. Uh, especially now, I'm closer to the beach than ever before. And uh, yeah, it would certainly be nice. Uh, yeah, Blair made a PDF out of the Forbidden Keys to Persuasion. Did he sell it? Did he give it away? I'm just curious. Um, what a good course. Mad respect for that guy. Uh, if anyone is a fan, if anyone knows him, would love to get the message to him that I'm a fan of his. Would love to have a conversation with him. He also wrote something I found on uh, his site, like when I did like a Google search of it, uh, something on enlightenment and found that I was in the similar perspective with him on and that as well so it was kind of cool that uh i like what he writes uh good afternoon ron uh and i all is well with me and i hope all is well with you too uh you're a master communicator and your passion for entrepreneurship is transformative well thank you albert i appreciate that does manipulation imply persuasion with the intent to fool or control someone without benefit to them i don't know man um you know it's at the, I guess at the end of the day, it's semantics, right? Like what's the difference between being, um, strong willed, stubborn, uh, foolhardy, skeptical. It's something I behold her, right? What's the difference between brainwashing, education and influence? It's in the mind of the beholder, I would say. So, um, that's where I'd go with it. Sells is a, sells is a shameless manipulation. I'm not sure what that means. Attention is a valuable currency. Currency we buy it every day. Yeah, that's why I wrote the Attention Age doctrines. I think I'm I'm very proud of the fact of how far ahead I was. Uh, I wrote those. I think I believe in 2007, right? The Attention Age doctrine one and two, and talking about one that attention was going to become the scarcest commodity online, which I think I called pretty accurately. You know, you got to remember, this is pre-Facebook. This is when Twitter just was on the scene and most people didn't know about Twitter. Like I wrote about it in the report. Um, and then in Attention Age Doctrine 2, which came out a few months later, I talked about people's attention going to Web 2.0, which is social media. So kind of called that kind of proud of uh this is a very interesting topic i think we should do several on these cool all right well that's what we'll do then mr cam fats uh nice haircut thanks man uh <laughs> you know i stopped using rogaine though and i think i might need to go back to using rogaine it's getting a little thin um so yeah or maybe i go on propecia or something uh i've had this hairline though since i've been like 18 so I'm not so worried about this. I'm worried about this, though. The price of being 50, I guess. Uh, please put that doc in the group so we can access. I can't put my notes to Blair Warren's because uh, too much of Blair is in there. Um, I would, but I just feel like I'd be violating a copyright. On If he gives the book away for free, I would do it. I'll let me know. But if he's charging for the book, I think people should buy that book. All right. Show the pain, increase the pain, offer a solution. Uh, partly, right? Partly. 
That's a very cool concept of redefining problems as symptoms of a deeper problem. Yeah, well, I mean, think about it, Cam. Uh, I did that with the manifesto, right? I attributed most of the problems in the internet marketing space to being an opportunity seeker. So it's not surprising, right, that I would have people get on um, group coaching calls and tell me that they're a reformed opportunity seeker. Just like... I define myself as having ADD, right? So it's very comparable to that. And it's extremely powerful. And it's something that is very much intertwined with creating demand, or at least the way I do it. I had the same experience with reading Driven to Distraction many years ago. Yeah. I, I But understand that it is... Whenever you take a group of behaviors and make a boundary around them, right? Create a new distinction that these behaviors are this. You're, it's, it's, it's wishy-washy, right? Because like we can, we can box up a whole bunch of behaviors and label them lots of things and, it goes in line with this other belief I have about reality being a lot more complicated than we could ever appreciate. And because of that, it's a lot more malleable um, because so much of reality is subjective or at least our experience of it, right? Has to be. And so it gives us this wide canvas to paint an argument on or to maps a solution on. I hope that makes sense. It makes sense in here. Uh, hopefully it's making sense over there. Hello from Southern California, April. Well, hello, April from Delray Beach, Florida. Hey, Stefan, I must read that book. This is what this is what I need at the moment. Glad to be here. Cool. Yeah, well, if if he sells that book, that's a damn good book. I hope you're talking about uh, forbidden keys, not driven to distraction. I was just listening to your Tuesday show, Golden Wisdom. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, Google keys, forbidden keys, you mean, right? 20 bucks? Wow, then that's a steal. It's all suggestion. Yeah, it is, right? All right. Let's see what Damon has to say. Hello, Rich. Here's a thought question. In order to be manipulative, you have to be deliberate and skillful. Therefore, it has to be a conscious process. Hmm? Therefore, it has to be a conscious process. So I question the suggestion that we are all manipulated from birth as if we do it unconsciously. It is probably a repetition of some form of habit and is not done with the intent of being manipulative. Or perhaps it is better to say that unconscious manipulation is a lesser of two evils, kind of like manslaughter versus culpable homicide. Really, like, when you try, like, I think what Saul Alinsky was talking about is very true. Like, when you have, even as a child, right, when you try to stay up later and you go to your dad and uh, as opposed to your mom or your mom instead of your dad, the, the kids are manipulative to try and get what they want. And... There's nothing wrong with that. It's just a recognition, right, that to some degree we are all manipulative. We are, it's just how we want to get our way. And sometimes we mask intent. Sometimes we don't. Generally, the, the decision to mask or not mask intent also plays to our goals. So, you know... We don't even know the reason why we do things most of the time, right? So we, we, we are not rational creatures. We're rationalizing creatures. So I just, I'm very careful to, I don't want to make this a question of ethics. I think when you get into ethics, you're already starting to... <sighs> that you justify the ends 
to get to the, or justify the means to, because of the ends. It, 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 it's open to a lot of problems. So I just prefer not to even go there. I don't know if that makes sense, what I'm trying to say there, but hopefully it is. Blair charges $20 for the PDF on his website. Then that is a bargain. And uh, this is the... That is one of the best bargains that out there, I would say, buying that for 20 bucks. And I obviously get nothing of that. Um, hey, Rich, just joining now. I totally agree with the topic. What are your thoughts on NLP? I'd love if you taught NLP. I took NLP. I studied NLP with Doug O'Brien and Joe Vital. No, not Joe Vitale. Um, oh, my God. Uh, Jesus Christ, I can't remember the guy's name. Can someone look up who wrote uh, Design Human Engineering? Uh, John Laval. Who wrote Design Human Engineering with uh, Richard Bandler? John Laval, that's who it is. Uh, uh, Doug O'Brien and John Laval is who I took NLP from and also took a like couple day thing with uh, Bandler. The... I never practiced to get good at it. And I think that there are too many people who drank the Kool-Aid who think it's more powerful than it is. Uh, but I do think there is, there are things that are very powerful in NLP uh, for sure. But uh, I don't put myself out there as an expert of it. Like I said, I did get my practitioners, whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't have any conscious or unconscious competence when it comes to the tactics of NLP, but I'm very familiar, obviously. Which book from Blair Warren? One Sentence Persuasion? Well, One Sentence Persuasion, he gave away for free. I don't know if that's changed. That used to be free. And then the Forbidden Keys to Persuasion was a course that was rather pricey, I think, at the time. Um, I mean, you know, it was certainly a lot more than 20 bucks. So the Forbidden Keys is the one I'm talking about. The one sentence persuasion course is great. If I'm choosing, I'm choosing forbidden keys because that's, you know, a full course. All right, there it is. Uh, consult, exam, and tests are all designed to interpret symptoms as signs of a deeper underlying problem. Exactly, Chris. Yep, makes perfect sense. Appreciate all the insights, man. Cool, appreciate you, man. I meant this live on persuasion tactics is what I need at the moment. I started learning language patterns and hypnosis. Oh, cool. Very cool. Um, I like I like reading Diltz. I like his stuff. Um, and I like, what is it called? Sleight of mouth. If you're going to study anything, you should study sleight of mouth, Stefan. Rich, can you use an advertorial lander where to pre-fame and then ask them to opt in to learn more where then you send them to the sales video? Of course. In fact, Giancarlo, I would say, right, that um, the smallest element of marketing from my definitions, right, would be an advertorial lander. Right, because you're trying to set up all the beliefs right then and there on that one page before popping them forward over to the actual sales message. And you're doing it in a place, right, where it's advertorial, so it appears like it is separate and distinct from the sales message, right? And in my worldview of marketing, um, well, before I even say it, since most people don't have clear definitions of marketing and sales, right? They don't clearly define those two. They also don't clearly, they can't, if you don't have clear definitions of those, you can't label them. And if you can't label them, you can't define when should marketing hand over to sales? When does that happen? When does a prospect move from, uh, from marketing to sales, right? In my the way I look at it, right? If marketing is about creating the beliefs and sales is about pushing someone out of status quo, then you move someone from marketing to sales when they've 
bought into the core concept, right? Because that was the whole agenda of the marketing campaign. If you can do that in a lander, that's phenomenal, right? If you do that in a one-page advertorial, that's phenomenal. So yes, is my long-winded answer to that good question. Uh, our mother was a strong, disciplined German-born immigrant, so we used our dad as the negotiator on our behalf. Yes, we were very manipulative. Yeah, all kids are, as I was too, right? And that doesn't change. Val. Yep. Okay, yeah, Laval. Uh, makes sense, Rich. Was not exposed to the book, so I had to pick your brain on that one. Thanks. Oh, no problem, my friend. Uh, I find it interesting that un that conscious persuasion is framed as evil and unconscious persuasion is seen as acceptable. There's a disconnect, the natural versus the skilled. It may be because some people fear the power and responsibility that comes with accepting an individual is capable of creation or destruction. That is interesting, Ulrich. Uh, we're, we're all much better unconscious manipulators than we are conscious manipulators. The art of selling involves manipulation. Even when the solution you sell is good for the clients, the process of selling it involves manipulation. Therefore, I say it's shameless manipulation. Okay. To each their own, and I would agree that selling generally does involve some manipulation. Uh, but not always, right? Like, I don't feel like when I walk into an Apple store that I'm being manipulated. Um, I've already been manipulated. That's why I'm walking into the Apple store. I'm reading Alchemy by Rory Sutherland. Oh, I love Rory. Uh, Sutherland and Ogilvy. He makes very good points around behavioral science and marketing. It's fascinating. Yeah, Rory, Rory's a solid guy. Um, Rory's done some really cool presentations for copywriters. Um, there's some on YouTube. Uh, one of them specifically is like, he starts out by saying something, and I, I watched this a long time ago, but um, he's like, I'm, he's talking to a room full of copywriters and I think that it's labeled like Rory Sutherland talking to copywriters or something like that. And he's like, I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't know. I'm going to tell you why it works. And uh, it's all about behavioral economics and Cialdini stuff and uh, social psychology. Yeah, Rory's, Rory's a font of knowledge and uh, really cool guy. It's very impressive to me how using the word manipulation versus influence. When I talk to people about marketing, gets me opposite reactions, even though it's just semantics. That's proof of how easily you can manipulate people by the words you use. Yeah. And probably the master at that, right, would be George Lakoff, um, you know, as far as metaphors of the mind. And um, then also Frank Luntz, um, spoken to him a few times. Uh, his books are really good and he's talking about it's not what you say it's what people hear right and there's a big difference between estate tax and death tax uh you know pro-abortion versus pro-choice um you know these kinds of ways of defining uh things by the words make a difference on how palatable it is right so uh let's i guess press on shall we all right. Oops, I just moved this thing, and now I, who knows where it's going to go. All right. I'm enjoying this uh, live stream. I hope you guys are too. Oh, wow. Look at that. I went all out. Let's go back in. Let's move this here. Oh, wow. You can see my cursor. How? Oh, oh, that's, not, that's not what I want. I want this. There we go. All right. Hmm. Oh, did he? Is that uh, Giancarlo? Did this just happen? Let me know. Um, that would be really sad. I've learned a lot uh, from Dan, for sure. All right, so we just went over kind of, sort of, preemptive problem creation. I'm not going to go too deep into that. That's kind of the teaching of it. I kind of have to say for my clients. Um, marketing rhetoric, right? The use of rhetoric techniques along with selective evidence techniques to substantiate claims, document challenges, prove solutions, and structure messages. 
right? So uh, there are many different types of rhetorical devices um, that you can leverage inside of marketing. And yeah, also some there I've read some really good books. I can't make any suggestions tonight, but if people remind me, maybe next time I could go downstairs and grab a few of them. There are some really good books on political speech writing. And I find a lot of them kind of carry forward into marketing really well, right? The idea of having like a, a throw line that it's not called the throw line. I just made up that word. I don't remember what it's called, but where, you know, you have the echo effect several times throughout. Um, yeah, there's a lot of rhetorical type devices like this that help with a message being digested, right? Just like a message that rhymes is more believable to the mind uh, than one that does not. Strange, but true. Let's see. Oh, wow. Okay. Crystallization. This is the one I wanted to really kind of dive a little deep into with you guys because I think you're going to dig it. It's really powerful. And uh, it's one of those things that I've taught for a while that it has not been uh, taken by a bunch of people. So it's something that most of you probably haven't seen before. Crystallization to prove the disease, right? So this goes back to number four. Oh, wait, no, we're going to six here. Let's go to crystallization. To show prospects and customers that what they currently dislike about themselves, their thoughts or behaviors, are actually what they need to succeed by showing them the positive intent and thereby erecting a massive reframe on what they perceive as their problems while radically increasing their bond with you and absolving failure and providing hope. Let me read that again. Uh, not because of repetition is the key, <laughs> but because it's important that you get this. To show prospects and customers that what they currently dislike about themselves, thoughts, or behaviors are actually what they need to succeed by showing them the positive intent and thereby erecting a massive reframe on what they perceive as their problems while radically increasing their bond with you, absolving failure, and providing hope. So I would imagine that right now, excuse me, uh, that you don't know what it is specifically, right? But it sounds powerful and uh, it is. And so this is what I wanted to spend some time on. So we're going to move this out of the way. Oh, wow. When I move it completely out of the way, it stays. How bizarre. All right. All right. Oh, that's so weird. All right. Let's go here for a second. Boom, 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 boom. All right. Okay. So this is a slide from my BGS webinar. Okay, and this slide is a collection of the previous nine slides. And in the webinar, I have up until this point, I don't remember exactly where, right? But what I've covered is uh, my success offline, right? The fact that I grew my clothing business from one and a half million to seven and a half million that I was successful in the record industry and then the hypnosis industry and how I grew that, um, from zero to 13 and a half million in a matter of a couple of years. And then I got online and then I struggled and this is now the path of my struggle. This was what was happening for me. Now understand that, I'm telling this story, right, of me being successful offline, coming online and struggling, right? And now 
being successful online, right? So I was successful offline and I was successful online, but there was this period of time where I was not successful online in between these two. And I'm making the argument that, well, I'm not making the argument yet. I'm, I've gone over now all the things that I was doing online that were ruining my, like what I didn't like about myself, what was going on for me at that time, right? I was unsure which marketing tactics to use. I was trying everything. Uh, I was wasting more and more of my life online. I was pulling all nighters sitting in front of the computer, just like impossible to pull myself away. I was jumping from place to place, trying to find things that would work. I felt overloaded with information, sometimes buying the same ebook twice because like I hadn't gotten to it, even though I had printed it out, how I was constantly disappointed by overhyped products. I bought into things that I'm like embarrassed at this point now to admit that I bought. I never got the results that I was hoping for. I started to question what was wrong with me. And I was concerned that I was not only going to let myself down, but I was going to let my whole family down, right? So these were the things. And now I'm sharing this as my story with the, and all of this is true, right? Like none of this is made up. This is what occurred for me. The, I'm telling it though, with the hope that what I'm sharing about myself lands and resonates with the person on the other side of the screen. Right, Because remember, I'm telling the story of someone who was successful offline. He's now successful online. But during this period, this was him. Right Now, if that's you and you're hearing me say this, you already now are leaning in. I'm describing you, even though I'm talking about me. The implication, of course, is, is that since I'm successful now, there's a clear path from here to where I am. Right, I call that an intersection of journeys. Well, actually, Michael Cage called it an intersection of journeys, and I've stolen it from him ever since. Uh, I've learned a tremendous amount from Michael Cage over the years. So, an intersection of journeys, right? So, my journey and their journey now have intertwined. And since I'm where they want to be, that's a good thing. Now, I've shared these things, and I'm hoping that some of these things we share in common, right? Now, I'm going to show them on the very next slide that each, that what causes these things, right? Wasting more of my life online, information overload, seduced into buying bullshit stuff, all this kind of stuff, right? That these are actually, what's behind these are actually everything that you need to succeed that these bad behaviors are caused by a the person with the right MO, right? The right way of looking at things, just following the wrong strategy. And before you say, hmm, how could you do that? I'm the proof, right? Like I didn't change. I was successful on offline, failed online, successful online. I'm the same person all the way through, why did I experience these things at this moment in time, not prior and not after? It's because I was following the wrong strategy, and let me prove it to you. Are you with me so far? Are you following this? Because this is so powerful. So I, I hope that you're getting this. And I'm not trying to tease with this or anything like that. I, I just, I like, this is so powerful. So let me know if you're getting this. And then once I know that, we'll go on to the next thing where I show you this, how it works. So while we're doing that, while I'm waiting for you to answer, uh, let's see. Loving it. I never heard of Blair until today. Cool. Yes, Dan passed a few months ago. Are you sure of that? 
because that was like said, and then he was in hospice, and then like I, I mean, I don't get online that much, but uh, oh, maybe he did. Rest in peace, then. Uh, hey, Damon, we hardly see photographs of your beautiful wife on Facebook. Repetition is key for message it. So it's like turning their perceived weaknesses into strengths. Yes, sort of. You could say that, Ron. It's showing them that the, the behaviors they dislike about themselves are actually caused by, this, by the things that will cause their success, which is, like I said, a massive reframe. That, to me, is the exact process of sales. Well, it's not, though. Uh, hey, Damien, why are we not seeing pictures of your beautiful? Didn't you ask that already? Sounds like... Uh... They see you and your success is future them. Yeah, on the intersection of journeys, for sure. Incredibly powerful. Keep going. Cool. Following. Yep. Uh... <laughs> uh, getting it. Got it. Cool. All right. So then let's go back. Oh, good. Dan is alive. Had a major health scare a few months back, though. A lot of people thought he died. He didn't. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. It would have been news to me that, like, I, I would have thought someone would have called me. All right. So, I am now going to show you, right? Well, before I even show you this for a second, let's go back because I need to explain something. What am I doing here? So behind every negative habit, behind every negative behavior, behind every action that you've ever taken that you really regret, that you wished you never did, was positive intent. We only do things because we want, because of what we perceive we get from it, right? Even if it's just good feelings, right? There is a positive intent to smoking crack. There's a positive intent for cheating in a game on your wife, on your husband, right? The positive intent is it's going to feel good. It's The positive intent is to check out for a little while, whatever it is. But we only do things because there's a positive intent, right? That's my point. Even if that intent in the long term is not positive, in the short term it is positive. So if that's the case, right, we can find the positive intent behind any behavior. And so what I'm doing in this slide is I'm taking the positive intent and I'm now using it as criteria that's needed for success. So in other words, because you do these bad things, you can succeed. Okay, so that's kind of the process there. Let me show you. Okay, so I'm calling it a core success trait, right? But unsure of which marketing tactics to use means that you're trying to find what works best and use what works best. We call that best practices in the corporate world, right? Wasting more and more of my life online or you wasting your life online means that you're willing to do whatever it takes to succeed. You're willing to put in the time. If you're frantically looking for what will work, it means that you're not closed-minded, that you're searching for answers and you're willing to find that answer anywhere. Information overload means that you've taken responsibility for your education and you take that responsibility seriously, right? So do you see what I'm doing here? I'm basically separating the negative from the positive, telling them that if they have the negative, they are positive and the proof is me who had all these negative things happen, although he didn't change. And he is telling you that what causes you to do these bad things will cause your success when you're following the right strategy. Let me know if you get it, if you do, uh, what you think of it, and then what questions you have. Now we'll go to the other diagram for a second here. 
So, let's zoom out a little. Don't worry about the numbers for today. Creating the disease, right? What negative experiences currently occur if the problem you solve exists? Right? Staying up all night, buying bullshit products, information overload. How is the prospect making it worse? Buying more marketing products. What is the ultimate effect of the problem or experience? Right? Proof that they need a cure. Crystallization. The positive intent behind those actions proves they have the disease and can't get to their goal without the cure. The root cause that turns the frustrations and problems into symptoms. What current problems, frustrations, or your prospect can you appropriate, right? Which problems can you turn into symptoms here? Crystallization lines up here. All right, let's go back to me. Uh, let's go to comments. <laughs> Did you manipulate yourself to offer such an amazing launch price for Steeler winners? Let me, no, you know what? Let me share with you the thought process there because I think it's educational at the very least, okay? Um, I wanted to grow my company within Agora. And the reason I wanted to do that was one, I've worked closely with Agora for a really long time. I really like the people that work in Agora. Some of them have left. And so that's part of the reason why I decided to leave. Um, I'm still a consultant to Agora. So let's be clear that I'm still on very good terms with them. Um, the reason I wanted to go to Agora though, was for really three reasons. One was their copy prowess. The second was their willingness to go negative uh, on acquisition. And obviously they know the info business backwards and forwards like I do. And, uh, and then also uh, sustainability. Um, and I actually talked about this, I believe. Yeah, I talked about this actually on a podcast I was on yesterday with Maxwell Finn that I like the next intellectual conquest so I don't cash in on as much as I should of stuff that I've helped pioneer, whether it's the automated webinar or things like that. And so the idea of having a group of talented people behind me to help monetize stuff, I like, right? But the reason I, the reason that Steal Our Winners went out at $50 a year instead of $50 a month, which is what the people in Agora wanted me to do, $50 a month, and I didn't want to. And I didn't want to because what I wanted to do was leverage the willingness of Agora to go negative and their copywriting chops and grow the newsletter to over 100,000 subscribers. And I felt at $50 a year, it's an absolute no-brainer. And the reason I wanted to get to 100,000 paid subscribers is, is that 100,000 paid subscribers in finance is worth about, well, creates about a $60 million business, give or take. My belief, based on the numbers, is that a, uh, a internet marketing business growth business that had 100,000 paid subscribers would do over 100 million. Since my goal was to build a $100 million business, it was based on having a newsletter that had 100,000 subscribers at $50 a year. Since, and the reason I felt I could get to 100,000 relatively quickly was the way that allowable acquisition cost is created at Agora, which is card value plus six months revenue. And then if we're going to be conservative, like 80% of that, right? So if, for example, the average card value is about 100 and a quarter, which generally is on a $49 newsletter and in internet marketing, let's say we get $300 per person on average over the first six months, then we would be able to spend up to $425 to get that $49 sale, which is an insane number, which means that we would be able to grow this thing wicked fast, right? So that was the plan. Since we're not going forward with Agora and we're not doing it that way, and I can't afford to lose 300 and some odd dollars per sale, 
because that means if you make 100 sales that day, you're now negative $30,000, right? Um, that we are pricing it to $50 a month, right? But we are going to give people one last chance to get in at $50 a year uh, because we feel like that's only fair. Uh, when getting into a new market, how do you know what the market beliefs are? Easiest way is to do some coaching. If you can't do coaching, Quora, Amazon, um, forums, Facebook groups. There's plenty at this point. Uh, Rich, can you pre-sell new subscribers in the email itself? Or would it be better to send them to a short email, curiosity-driven, and then send them to an advertorial pre-frame them to warn them up? It depends, uh, Giancarlo. So I, I'd say you have to test it. Um, if the advertorial, uh, if the advertorial looks like an advertorial, whether that's email or on the page, I think it will outperform if it's just like email text, right? So there's that to be considered. Um, but I would, uh, you got to test it. I, I, other than that, I wouldn't be sure. Turning negatives to positives is awesome. Cool. Uh, is Slight of Mouth a book? And what was the other resource? Well, the first thing, Stefan, that you should probably get your hands on is Forbidden Keys to Persuasion by Blair Warren. Uh, not NLP, but in my opinion, even better. And then if you are going to study, um, if you're going to study, uh, Language Patterns, Sleight of Mouth is a book written by Robert Diltz that really breaks it down. Not necessarily the best way to learn how, but academically to understand it all. Then uh, there's some, I forget, uh, there's a guy in the UK that has like a workbook on a lot of the language patterns. Like where, Because like to get good at it, you just got to practice it. Um, but someone like me, and I would imagine you might be this way too, I like to kind of work top down. I'd like to understand how it all works before I then study the tactical parts of it. I also find it's easier to remember that way too, personally, because I have a lay of the land and I know where to put things. Got it. Eye opening. Very cool, April. Yep, I get it. Cool. It's genius. Cool. A bit like the hero's journey. <clears throat> My hesitation is that this is so much more than that, right? Yeah, sure, it is a hero's journey, right? but it's a hero's journey that illustrates to you that what you thought was a problem is your key to greatness. And that's not embedded in most hero stories. Love this, got it. It's a genius strategy, I absolutely get it. Cool, Elise. Uh, this is awesome. Perception really is everything. It is. This is true. Reminds me of Socrates' dictum, all people choose the good as they perceive it. That's true, right? That is so true. And it's like, that's kind of on the previous live stream when I shared what I wrote. That's what I truly believe, right? That all people choose the good as they perceive it. Which is why, like, we really need to have empathy for one another. And we really need to recognize that just because someone disagrees with us politically, it does not mean that they're evil. It does not mean that they're, you know, they're trying to destroy the world or the country or anything else. It's just their perception of what is the best choice. All sides, right? All sides. Uh, I get it. I'm wondering how all that plays out in a presentation. Oh, well, I guess you'll have to get your hands on my old uh, BGS webinar. Um, all right. So let's see. Um, check DNA agency storytelling book. I don't know what that is, Priyat. What's your take on pa Paulo Costa? Do you think he can beat him in a rematch? Doubt it. I think if he would have beat him, he, if he could beat him, he would have. Um, 
anyway, so what should we go over next, guys? Should we call it a day? Should we wrap it and make this just all action-packed teaching? Do you have any questions about how to apply it? Um, other things you want to talk about as it relates to persuasion. I have a lot more to share. I'm uh, just not sharing it all today. I, don't, I, I, I want to let this marinate with you guys, too. I, I think it's what I've just handed you is something that's literally made me millions and millions of dollars and has helped me help others make millions of dollars. And I've never seen this taught anywhere. Uh, I created it. So I don't, I hope it's not taught. Anywhere. Well, at this point, it could be taught in other places. When I, when I created it, it was not, it was created from my own imagination, not uh, from uh, a textbook or a course or anything like that. All right. <laughs> yes, we need to. We should go over that, but maybe I'll save that for uh, uh, next time. A little Aristotle. Um, I'll send you a link. It's a Brand Hero's Journey Breakdown. Cool. All right, definitely. Post it to the group, Priyat. Love to look at it. Um, I don't share the opinion that all people choose good. There's evil people out there. Well, look, even they... Stefan... If they're evil and they enjoy hurting people, then for them it's good, right? Like, I'm not saying everybody chooses what they perceive as good. That's all I'm saying. Uh, goes, goes from little things such as not washing your, washing your teeth. Once you're aware, it's a good thing to do to the big things murder rid. <sighs> In their eyes, Stefan, in the eyes of each person, the things they do are justified and good. For the most part, right? I will rewatch this once it's on YouTube and take notes. Uh, time of death. Call it. <laughs> uh, some folks advertise persuasion hypnosis to make people do what you want. Anything uh, on that? Um, you can't make people do something against their will, but most people have a weak will. That's one. And will implies that there's conscious awareness. So I'll share a story with you. Okay. I don't know if I've ever shared this story. I've certainly shared it privately. I don't know if I've ever shared it publicly. So I've shared, I think, in the past that when I had my clothing business and I had my music business, uh, I partied quite a bit, did a lot of ecstasy when I was younger. And um, then I stopped. And when one time when I was getting hypnotized, my hypnotist, asked me, like, because I was going every week, I was really interested in this, I uh, wasn't sure what I was going to do with it yet, but as I've shared before, I'm highly hypnotizable, so the sessions were profound for me, and I didn't have anything specific I wanted to work on, and so the hypnotist was like, what do you want to work on today, and I was like, um, uh, okay, how about this, I would love to be able to feel as good as I felt on ecstasy without having to take ecstasy. So that's, that was the goal of the session. We have the session. Um, um, like I said, I'm highly hypnotizable. Most of the time I don't remember the session whatsoever. So it is what it is. Uh, go home that night. Everything's fine. A couple days later, uh, yeah, maybe two days later, wake up with a really bad cold. Um, another day or two later. Uh, I wake up at three o'clock in the morning with the worst headache I've ever had in my life. And I don't get headaches and I like headache, a headache that I wanted to literally take stuff to pass out. Cause I was in that much pain. I must've taken like 10 Advils or something like that. Pass back out, wake up the next morning. I'm fine. Next night. Three o'clock in the morning again, wake up with this insane headache. I'm crying. I'm in pain. So the next morning, I wake up. I'm fine. 
uh, I'm calling the doctor, right? Like, I don't know, the cold, there's headaches, what the hell's going on? Go to the doctor. He's like, well, the good news is, is that it's just a cold. The bad news is, is that you have TMJ. And he's like, these muscles in here are so inflamed, you know? And I'm going to give you a muscle relaxer, and I don't remember what else. So I started taking that, and he's like, but you got to get to the dentist, like ASAP. Call my dentist. Go see him. Get a bite plate made. And um, doing all this, I cancel my hypnosis appointment for the following week. I'm dealing with all this crap, right? And uh, then the following week, I go back to my hypnotist. Her name was Julie Flanders, and Julie's like, hey, what happened last week? Why'd you cancel? And I'm like, oh, wow, it's been crazy. It's a crazy week. I had this cold. And uh, then I started getting these horrible headaches, figured they, they were linked to each other, went to the doctor, found out they weren't, found out I have TMJ, went to my dentist, got a bite plate, you know, telling her the whole story. And she's like, do you think that had anything to do with the suggestion I gave you? And I said, what suggestion did you give me? And she said that when you were hypnotized, I asked you, how do you know? when the ecstasy was kicking in and you said that you clench your teeth, that you feel the desire to clench your teeth. So I told you any time that you want to feel the feelings of those feelings, all you have to do is clench your teeth. And what's so interesting is, is that in that moment, not before that moment, not the two weeks when I like, not with the headaches, not with the doctor, not with, telling me I had TMJ, N never did it go in my mind that I've been clenching my teeth a lot recently. However, as soon as she said it, I was like, oh my God, I have been clenching my teeth all the time recently. The post-hypnotic suggestion that anytime I wanted to feel that good, all I needed to do was clench my teeth, had me clenching my teeth outside of my awareness all the time. And as soon as she said it, I recognized it and that was it. It was done, right? Like, I mean, I didn't need my bite plate. I didn't, I never got a headache again. It was gone. Now that's because it was outside my awareness. As soon as it was right. Hence there was no will. As soon as it was inside my awareness, there was will back. So it was actually that experience that convinced me I wanted to learn more about hypnosis and I wanted to use this to help people because if it could do that, it could do other things too. And, and so that was actually the convincer for me. So, uh, that's my TMJ ecstasy, um, story. Um, all right. Cheetah's club in Palm beach is open. Uh, <laughs> I'm not allowed to go. My girlfriend, Kim, will not allow me. Uh, the email image caught my attention because that's been bouncing around in my head. Speaker, audience, message. Uh, I just thought it was a cool image. And I had this image of me with my arm, like, holding down, and I was looking for something I could put it in. And I was like, oh, this will be perfect for a persuasion thing. Uh, where can I find more on this topic, Rich? Oh, on what I just covered? Um, I... Someone just bought something of ours. I don't want to say what it is yet. Um, but we have stuff that goes into this in depth, and probably the report writing workshop is probably um, the thing that I would say uh, has this, and then what goes into even more depth on it would be a program called D3, which is my marketing program. Like once the awareness of what's good and bad, choosing bad is evil by that definition. I studied a lot of serial killers and high school shooters. They are mostly all aware of what they're doing is not good, but yes, yeah, semantics. Not good for others, but what they feel will make things right for them. That's my point. Not trying to argue with you though, Stefan. Uh, and if you're into that kind of stuff, Stefan, you have to read, um, oh God, what is that book? It's a red cover. I think it's called The Wisdom of Psychopaths. Check that if that's a book, The Wisdom of Psychopaths. 
Amazing book. The good depends on value structure, thought system, programming, totality of everything up to this moment in their life. It seems to be at the root of all conflicts because everyone assumes they're playing with the same, by the same distinctions, by definitions and assumptions are rarely surfaced. So true, Ulrich. I mean, just even like Nietzsche, right? And wealth to power. And the idea that like everything that is morality is what religious institutions have injected into the world to protect the weak from the bold. Whether you agree with that or not is a total reframe on everything that like our society is built on. It's interesting at the very least and totally changes what's good. I am highly hypnotizable and I love putting people into the somnambulistic state as well. TMJ can be pretty nasty. I've treated a lot of folks with that. Uh, Tracing the effects to sub subconscious suggestion is awesome stuff. That's scary. I would never allow someone to hypnotize me. Huh? Well, I have total trust for Julie Flanders. Uh, she was very pivotal in my life and helped me at a time when I needed it. A few hours ago, I had a coaching call helping a client use TOC evaporating clouds. So cool. Cool, Ulrich. And, you know, I'm talking to Alan Bernard right now. And Alan Bernard is probably one of the people that I have insane levels of respect for as it relates to just someone being wicked smart and probably the best T one of the best TOC people out there, uh, Alan Bernard, Barnard. Bernard? Uh, Barnard. I, I forget. Uh, he's the CEO, I think, of Gold Rat Labs. Um, he's doing some stuff right now with Jay Abraham, maybe, and Peng Jun. Um talking to them about that him and his wife have been in conflict spend money versus save money and after 90 minutes we realized they never drilled down to specifics what do you mean what is an acceptable savings what is break even next step they're going to itemize expenses and instead of going in circles they'll be able to move forward exactly so many of you know i mean gold rat little gold rat believed that there were no conflicts in reality right it is what it is and that the source of all conflicts are invalid or unsurfaced assumptions. What workshop? I did a workshop called the report writing workshop where I taught people how I write my reports. Um, the agony and ecstasy of TFJ. Yeah, that'll be my, that'll be the name of my memoir. There you go. Is the D3 updated or is it the older version? Well, the older version was just like two years ago, my friend. Uh, and human nature does not change. Uh, I agree. Doing that evil shit gave them good feelings. Yeah, but Stefan, the wisdom of psychopaths. Rich, are you ever going to run the TOC 30 marathon course again? I have no plans of it, unless Alan Barnard can tell, help me figure out a way to teach it where I don't feel, where I feel people can get it without me having to handhold them. Uh, that was the issue there, right? Like, you know, I, I sold BGS for over a decade, almost two decades past when it was live and it was fine. Right. Um, we've updated a certain parts of it now, uh, but people didn't need my hand holding. They could check in once a week and that would be enough, uh, with theory of constraints. It's a little bit more complicated than that. And because of that, like once I, took people through it, I realized I would need to continue to take people through it. I made exceptions when I had like clients that were super smart. Um, I let them go through it because they'd be able to do it um, on their own. But I don't think most people could. I'm not even sure I could. Um, it's heavy duty stuff. Yeah, TOC. Uh, where is the sign up for champions? I don't know what champions means. Do you mean steal our winners? If you're talking about steal our winners, you got to join our Facebook group. Um, all right, guys. So let's see. There's so much more with persuasion, right? Uh, having a common enemy. Um, I read this one great book. It was a little orange book. I think it was called The Elements of Persuasion, I think, or The Persuasive Element. I don't remember what. I think The Elements of Persuasion. And at that time when I was reading that book, the TV show House was really popular. And uh, uh, for those of you who've watched that show, um, people close to me 
like J. Abraham. J. Abraham, I think he was the first one that told me that House reminds me, reminds him of me, because uh, I can be blunt and <laughs> kind of hardcore like that. And then I have other friends who say I'm more like Larry David. Um, and uh, the example they always give is like someone gets a new house and they want to show me around, and I'm like, nah, I've I don't need to see the house, right? So this is kind of how I am in my personal life. Uh, let's see. Oh, TOC? Yes, Theory of Constraints. Sorry. Uh, Strategic Profits Facebook group? Yep, that's the one. Uh, need to train trainers, Rich, to facilitate TOC? No, no. Um, that would that would be the Gold Rat Foundation that would do that. I'm nowhere qualified enough. So, or someone like Alan. Um, when... I w I've been called in for a couple of projects for TOC for clients. One was for Agora for their copywriting stuff. But when I came in, like they didn't really need TOC. They needed other things. But in the back of my mind, I was always planning on reaching out to Alan whenever I was going to, whenever I came, if I ever came up against something that I didn't feel I could handle. And uh, it's a shame that I never reached out to him because in the last month or so, several people have told him he should get in contact with me and we've been in contact now and it's like he's like oh man I wish I would have discovered you like 10 years ago this would have like shortcutted so much for me and I'm like you know I've been thinking about reaching out to you for the last 10 years um just never came across something I didn't have a reason to but I had tremendous respect for his thinking and uh Let's see. All right, let's kind of wrap this. So is hypnotism dependent on you reaching an alpha state or have you got to go into a deeper state of relaxation? Well, generally, it's more of a theta state, right? It goes beta, alpha, theta, delta. And uh, those are the more established, right? There's gamma and whatever, but beta, alpha, theta, delta. And um, and actually, I have a muse right there. Like, you know, it's a EEG. So when I meditate, I can look at my brain waves. Um, so it's generally more theta, but um, but it, it's so much of it is really dependent on the person. Are they open and receptive to it? Do they want it? Are they trusting? Are they imaginative? Can they focus? Those are the kinds of issues. <laughs> Dr. House, the best TV series ever. Oh, so why was I bringing that up? I wasn't bringing it up to tell you that Jay thought of me as House. Um, I was telling you that because... At that time, House was really popular, and in that book, they were talking about how you root for House, even though he's kind of an asshole, right? And the reason you root for House, even though he's kind of an asshole, and the reason he's likable, and all those things is because the common, the enemy is always horrible. It's a killer. It's silent, right? So you root for House because of the, because of the enemy. So having a common enemy is a really powerful, uh, persuasive tactic. How shit was great. Alan, Alan Bernard, Bar Bernard. B it's either Barnard or Bernard. B-A-R-N-A-R-D or B-A-N-A-R-D. He's from uh, South Africa, I believe. Uh, CEO of Gold Rat Research. Thanks for today's session. My pleasure, man. So um, as always, guys, um, thanks for being here. We'll continue the persuasion kick for a little while here. It seems like it's a popular topic. It seems like we got more people on today than we have been, so that's kind of cool. And uh, you guys have been very participative. Thank you for that. And uh, let's see. I My girlfriend's coming in this weekend. I have friends coming in this weekend. I'm excited about that. Mike Filsane rented a boat for Saturday. I'm excited about that. Um, and what else? We just released the latest uh, Steel R winners. Excited about that. Started recording next month already. I'm excited about that. So just thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, thank you for listening to me. Thank you for asking questions. Thank you if you shared it, and if you haven't, it's not too late. And trust me, I go back and I look and see who shares. Um, I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for listening to me. And uh, I look forward to talking to you all again. More on persuasion in the coming weeks. Tuesdays and Thursdays, 2 to 4, 6 to 8. 
Till next Tuesday, to higher profits and beyond, Rich Sheffrin, over and out.